History, my young friends. Just because your lives are as fleetingly swift as a hummingbird's flight is no cause to say mine constitutes history. History is the weave of things outside life, not for those still within its loom. Simbla Havel, Lawkeeper of House Havold. Greetings, Explorer. In modern pop culture, elves already took a very special place. They are also one of the most interesting and lore-rich species from the Dungeons and Dragons system and Forgotten Realms setting in particular. Especially interesting is the actual origin of elves on the continent of Faerun. However, for an unprepared investigator it might be a little bit overwhelming, because you have to dive deep into a rabbit hole of history and myths to find at least some approximation of the truth. So, let's explore this lore today together. The story of elves is integral to the story of Seldarin, elven pantheon of deities which translates from elvish as fellowship of brothers and sisters. And therefore, it's inherent to the story of the greater god, Karelon Larethian. Also known as a protector and the creator of elves, Karelon came from the realm of Isgard, also referred to as Asgard or Glatzheim. In his conquering of lands of giants, he settled the plain of Arvandor, which later will become the home of all Seldarin gods and origin place of primal elves. According to reputable wizard Mordekainen, all elves including those destined to become deities of the Seldarin and the Dark Seldarin were born from Corellon's blood spilled from his wounds during a battle with Grumsh, patron god of orcs. These first primal elves possess shape-shifting abilities, reflecting the freedom of their creator. Corellon selected certain favorites to become deities, among whom Lols, then Araushni, was particularly privileged. Observing other races achieving greatness, Lols argued that elves should abandon their shape-changing nature in favor of a fixed form enabling them to assert dominion over everything. Every elf agreed to this transformation, but Corellon, appalled by their decision, confronted Lols. Before he could act, she seized the moment to attempt his murder. Many elves, realizing the depths of her treachery, opposed her, while others remained loyal. These loyalists became the Dark Elves and their deities later. In punishment, Corellon made Lols into a Tanar Ri, the demonic entity of chaotic physical form and nature. She was cast into the abyss, becoming a demon lord. Elis Tree, daughter of Lols and Corellon, although she did not side with her mother, still chose to accompany the Dark Elves. Araushni adopted the name Lols and established the 66th layer of the abyss the demon web pits as her new domain. It's hard to be certain about exact dates because of how ancient the story is. However, basic calendar dates in D&D often refers to certain events. For example, a standing stone placement which started the calendar of Dale Reckoning, an event known as Declaration of Unity between humans of Dale Lands and elves of Cormantir. This calendar will further be noted as a pivotal point to the time tracking, marked as Dale Reckoning, or simply DR. In elven lore recorded themselves, there is another point of view for the creation myth. According to their story, gods of Seldarin presumably pre-existed as entities along with Corellon Rlaritian himself. And around 30,000 years before DR, Arushni Lols, with the assistance of her son Weiraun, assembled a coalition of malevolent deities to challenge the Seldarin. 
and orchestrated an assault on Arvandor, aiming to dethrone Corellon. Nonetheless, the main point of both versions is that the War of the Seldarin happened and resulted in splitting the Pantheon into Seldarin and Dark Seldarin, headed by Corellon and Lols, respectively. But even before that, the primal elves and deities already started spreading their brood. Further descendants of both pantheons happened to inhabit the Feywild plain of Fey, from which Fey originated. That's how the first Telquesir or Telquas, as they call themselves in native language, appeared. Later on, they will become known as elves. Approximately the same 30,000 years before DR, the Fae opened portals from the realm of Fae to planet Toril, enabling the first elves to cross over and settle on the one of the most well-known continents of Forgotten Realms, Faerun. The initial arrivals included the Green Elves, also known as Wood Elves, Lethar, Wolf Shifters, and Avariel, Winged Elves. Following them, the second wave brought the Dark Elves to the jungles of Southern Faerun and the Sun and Moon Elves to the north. The main population to migrate were Green Elves who lived in small scattered tribes. At the time they worshipped the fairy gods instead of then unknown to them, Seldarin. There were at least nine different subraces of Elves and three subcategories. High Elves and Eladrin, included sun or cold elves, who were highly civilized and gifted in wizardry. Moon elves, or silver ones, were nomadic and interacted with other races. And star elves, also known as mithril, who lived in the demi-plain of Sildeuir. Sylvan elves, including wood elves, aka copper, and wild elves, aka green, preferred simple forest lives and feral reclusive existence. Drow, a dark skinned subrace, lived in the Underdark. Aquatic elves were water breathing, Avarial were winged and mostly extinct, and Litari were rare sylvan elves who could transform into wolves. Mixed elf races included half elves. Fairy, offspring of an elf and a an half fiend, Saladrin, offspring of an elf and a celestial entity Eladrin, and Dragloth, created by a ritual mating between Lol's high priestess and the demonic entity Glabrazu. While each Telkisir race possessed its own distinct characteristics, there were several features common to all of them. By human standards, they were often regarded as fair and beautiful, exuding a natural grace despite their sometimes frail appearance. Elves were distinguished by their pointed ears and the absence of body hair, except for eyebrows, eyelashes and the hair on their scalp. Standing between 5 foot 4 and 6 feet 1.6 1.8 meters and weighing around 130-170 pounds, 60-77 kilos, they were typically slender and athletic. Elven complexions varied similarly to humans. Wood elves often had coppery or pale skin, while wild elves displayed darker pigmentation. Hair was usually dark, with shades of brown or black being common. Wood elves could also be seen with copper red or blonde hair, and occasionally with hues of orange or even green. Their eyes were often brown hazel or a striking emerald green. These features combined to create an image of ethereal beauty and otherworldly elegance that set the Telkisir apart from other races. Telkisir were generally relaxed, possessing a level of patience and detachment afforded by their long lives. They were not easy excited and lacked the greed that sometimes characterized other races. They viewed the lives and concerns of younger races as fleeting and 
found little joy in short-time victories. Instead, elves took pleasure in enduring pursuits such as the arts or the honing of their skills, finding satisfaction in activities that offered long-lasting fulfillment. For the same reasons, they exhibited a patience uncommon among other humanoids. With a focus on the long term, elves were slow to make friends or enemies, as they measured time in centuries rather than decades. Corellon's children were dedicated to whatever they pursued, rarely forgetting serious offenses, but often ignoring minor slights. In many cases, they were known for intense but fleeting passions, easily swayed by laughter, anger or sorrow, and just as quickly soothed. This impulsive nature led many other races to perceive them as flighty or impetuous. However, beneath this seemingly whimsical exterior, elves were typically responsible and reliable. Their long lifespans contributed to their unique perspective, making it challenging for them to take some matters as seriously as shorter-lived races. Nonetheless, when faced with genuine threats, elves proved to be loyal and steadfast allies. Telkesir were known for forming strong and uplifting friendships. They cherished simple pleasures like dancing, singing, foot races, and contests of skill. Fun-loving by nature, they had an aversion to mundane or uninteresting tasks. Despite their preferences for joy and merriment, elves could become grimly serious when their friends, family, or way of life were threatened. However, it was not a rare occurrence that they appeared distant and unfriendly to other races, like humans and halflings due to their much shorter lifespans. Presumably elves found it easier to avoid these races than to befriend individuals who lived only a fraction of their lifespan. Dwarves and elves had different values since mountain fellas favored hard work and straight lines, while elves preferred relaxation and natural shapes. Despite these differences, they could form strong friendships. Gnomes and elves generally got along well due to their mutual love of life and fine arts. With halflings, they had a lukewarm relationship, finding halflings' curiosity childlike. Humans were viewed with both fear and respect, acknowledged their rapid adaptation and mastery of magic but wary of their tendency to claim lands greedily. While strong friendships could form, so could hostilities. Also, Telkisir possessed a range of abilities that distinguished them from other humanoid races. They were supremely aware of surroundings boasting keener senses of sight and sounds than humans. All elves had the remarkable ability to see clearly in low-light conditions, while the drow also possessed the ability to see in complete darkness. Agile and dexterous, they could move swiftly even through the roughest terrains. Their precision in attacks was unparalleled, displaying a level of accuracy unusual for other humanoids. Elves enjoyed incredibly long lives, reaching what they considered adulthood at 110 years of age and living for up to 700 years or more. Wood and wild elves matured at a similar rate to humans, but showed few signs of aging beyond adulthood, with the most noticeable changes being a grain or tuckering of their hair. These elves remained healthy and vibrant, even in their later years, often living well over two centuries. Many elves did not require sleep, instead finding rest in a meditative state known as reverie or trance. This state was a restorative as true sleep, but left them aware of their surroundings. In reverie, elves achieved the same restorative effects as humans do through sleeping in about two-thirds the time. 
This ability also made them resistant to supernatural effects that induced sleep, as their semi-aware state provided a natural defense against such powers. Elves had a profound affinity for freedom, valuing unrestricted liberty over the constraints of civilized law and order. In elven cultures, the greater virtue was often the liberty of oneself and others. This love for freedom was unusually tempered by a good and generous nature, although there were exceptions, notably Drow, who stood as a stark example of evil among the Telkesir. Elven society did not distinguish between males and females, treating them equally in all areas. Both genders achieved power and fame in equal measures. With a historical tendency for more women in positions of authority, resulting in more queens than kings. Unlike some other societies, elves recognized and valued the potential of women. The elven word for the people was Telkesir, while N Telques referred to non elves, often giving other races the impression that elves were elitist or condescending. However, Elves typically saw these terms as merely descriptive. Though perceived as arrogant, elves did not harbor particular hatred for any race, though individual attitudes varied. The most significant conflict was with the Telquasir, primarily between the Drow and other elven races. Many elves took up the adventurous lifestyle for various reasons. Some were driven by boredom or a sense of wanderlust seeking to explore beyond their homelands. Elves disliked being tied down, and often pursued careers conducive to adventuring. Some enjoyed demonstrating their skills with a bow or sword, while others adventured to help others. Elves living among humans often took an artistic role such as mistral, artists or sages. They were also valued as martial instructors due to their renowned skills with bow and sword. Also elves were omnivorous, but tended to eat very little meat, aiming to minimize their impact on the natural world. This diet reflected their belief that consuming vegetation was less disruptive to natural harmony, and was influenced by their nomadic traditions, which required easily preservable food. With all this being said, hopefully now we understand much more about elves, their society, habits, and most important, their origin. There are many more stories to come, but it's a conversation of totally another exploration.